Hi folks, welcome to Sorting Myself Out, and today I have for you a discussion between Ian McGilchrist and Tim Freak. Tim has been gracious and kind enough to allow us to post this discussion to our YouTube channel. As you know, Tim and I have been collaborating on some different projects, including the upcoming interview that I filmed with him and Ken Wilbur. Stay tuned for that, but please go check out Tim's website, go check out his YouTube channel, subscribe to it. He's really doing a lot for us over here on Sorting Myself Out. He's an excellent philosopher. He's written over 30 books. He's got a lot to say and a lot to offer, and I think that you'll find his conversation with Ian McGilchrist just absolutely fantastic. So I hope you enjoy. My name is Tim Freak. I call myself a philosopher, but essentially I'm simply a curious human being. This series is an opportunity for me to meet with remarkable people for deep conversations about the perennial mysteries of life and death. And that's why I've come to the beautiful Isle of Skye to speak with Ian McGilchrist. Ian is a former literary scholar at Oxford University, a respected psychiatrist and a groundbreaking thinker, best known for his seminal work on the left and right sides of the brain in his book, The Master and His Emissary. So Ian, um, Ever since I've been a little boy, I think, I felt that being alive is the most enormous mystery. And the more I found out about it, the more mysterious it's become. And I can remember being young and thinking how strange it was that the world never seemed to acknowledge it. That there was, I'd watch switch on the TV and there was programs on every damn thing that I could imagine, but I never switched on the TV and saw someone go, life, mm. what? What, what, what is this? What's going on? And I think what I want to do with this series of conversations is come together with some remarkable people such as yourself and just start with the most fundamental thing, which is you and I are human beings on this bittersweet journey of being alive. And we both got older. Uh, what... What is it? How, how have you come to terms with that mystery? How do you see it in your, as you make that journey? I think intrinsically it's a mystery one never comes to the bottom of. As William James said, we can never close our accounts with reality. And I think just being aware of that is both very valuable and, as you say, somewhat rare. We, we take the most mysterious things for granted um, such as the, the nature of time and consciousness and that we're alive at all or that there is anything rather than nothing. So these things are um, eternally intriguing, but that's, that's part of their, their value. I mean, if we could say, oh, I know exactly what, what it is. Uh, well, first of all, you'd be a fool. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but secondly, um, you would have lost something of what it is that makes life uh, have meaning. The odd thing is that if we, if we could narrow down the meaning of these things in, in a simple way to what we normally mean by, oh, that means that, then it would have no meaning. Its meaning depends on its meaninglessness at one level, much as the idea of purpose uh, would be vitiated if it was clear that there was a purpose in sense of um, a utility, you know, we do this because of that. So, so one of the things which I, I, that I have explored a lot is the coexistence of opposites, and I know that's an area which mm. you've obviously written an uh, extremely famous book about um, in relationship to the brain, which hopefully we'll get a chance to chat about. But one of the opposites that plays itself out for me all the time is the, is the way in which I feel like I can live with an appreciation of the mystery, the numinous nature of existence, and an, a, a story I'm telling, 
which I'm constantly trying to refine. I mean, one of the reasons I want to have these conversations is that it refines my story, my understanding. You'll say things which I can increase the story I tell. And one of the things I see often generally is that we don't realize we're embedded in a story, that there is a cultural story which we take for granted. And that part of the function of doubt and mystery is to come out of that story and actually see, oh, see this, to actually be conscious of the, the, in this moment we're, we, there's this breathtaking mystery, we don't know what it is, and then we have the best story we can find to navigate it. I, I mean, and like open to, it up too, to the, the deeper stories open up deeper experiences. Yes, I'd like to pick up the word story because, of course, nowadays it's almost can be used in the term of meaning a lie, telling stories, children yeah. say. Yeah. Um, and both the word story and the word fable and the word myth, which are all used to mean things that are fundamentally unlikely to be true, started off as words that designated a perfectly truthful approach to reality. Yeah. And when, uh, when we normally, philosophers and scientists, talk about a narrative or, or a story, um, the background to that is often that we make it up in order to comfort ourselves because we need some sort of meaning. So we invent it. Um, and there again, that word has changed. In, in, invention used to mean discovering something, finding it, whereas now it means making it up. Yeah. Um, so I believe there is, very importantly, a way of dealing with these imponderables that you mentioned, which is not head-on. The more you try to analyze it directly, the more you come away with a handful of, of dust. You need to approach it in a more oblique way, implicitly, and this is where art, music, poetry, and religion take their value from being able to embody things that normally we can't talk about directly. If the tendency is then to dismiss them because they can't be talked about directly, or because uh, this involves a narrative or a, or, a, or a mythos or something, is to misunderstand another way of grasping reality. So one of the things which strikes me about that is that there seems to be, in, in maybe in, if there is one, the intellectual mainstream, which is probably actually quite small, really, but nevertheless within its, yeah, within its own domain is dominant, which then percolates through, which when, you, when it says oh, you tell a story about it or you make up meaning, seems to imply that the imagination is somehow unreal, that it's a bolt-on extra. There's reality, which is physics and biology, kind of, and then there's this bolt-on extra, which is the whole realm of the imagination. Whereas it seems to me that the imagination is the most emergent level of reality. It, it's the whole journey of evolution over these 13.8 billion years has led to Imagination has gone from hydrogen to ideas. It's gone from matter to something not made of matter. And that in that realm of ideas where we're creating stories, and it's not a bolt-on extra. It's actually another level of, it's it, not the most real exactly, but the most emergent, the, le the, the latest level of reality. It's, it's all been leading to this. Yes, I hadn't thought of it in those terms uh, as, as something that's uh, a product of evolution. Partly because I imagine that imagination is foundational, that it is part of an important part of creative consciousness, and that actually everything that exists partakes of it. So I wouldn't see it as uh, historically a bolt-on any more than ontologically a bolt-on. Uh, so, perhaps that wasn't what you meant. No, no. I mean, in a way, because it, I mean, it's, it, for me in my own journey, it's been a big shift to take on the evolutionary story because I found it so because I find it fun fundamentally so optimistic. I, I, I'm absolutely in agreement about that. I believe evolution is uh, very important in every sense. I don't mean just biological evolution, yeah. but the evolution of the cosmos. Oh, yeah. uh, I believe that it is a constant becoming, not a, not a static being. Um, and, and that implies that its evolution is where creation is. But its evolution, its creation is imagination, that is the bringing into reality of something that formerly was only potential. That seems to me at the ground of existence. And you probably know that um, Coleridge made a very important distinction between imagination and fantasy. 
which is not enough reflected on. Fantasy, he saw as um, the rearrangement of elements in reality that we're already familiar with in novel ways in order to create new effects. It's just really um, not asking us to look at, visit the foundations of what we experience, but just think of new ways of combining it. Whereas imagination was intrinsic to anything being present to us at all. It's only through our consciousness um, bringing it into being, which is a form of imagination, um, that things come about so at all. So imagination like conceptualization, like the, the I can no, see? No, not conceptualization, because that involves um, creating a concept uh, where I'm talking about something even more fundamental than a percept. Okay. Uh, I'm talking about something that, in other words, the, whatever it is that we, ex we, we are able to know at any level, yes. which, which one of the most foundational is perception, yeah. is already very much uh, moulded by and shaped by our, our attention, by the way in which we dispose so of So that is what making us conscious, conscious of something? Well, yes, but I mean, attention is at the root of how we see everything. And if we yeah. change the nature of our attention, we literally change the world. We change what it is that is there. Okay, so what you've just said there, I think, is the probably one of the most intriguing things for me about the whole thing about being alive. So most of my work is to do with exploring for myself and then sharing with other people what happens when you shift your attention yeah. in radical ways and how that opens up a different perception. So I really get that. I, 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 when I'm talking about the imagination evolving, it feels to me that the human imagination... What I experience, now there may be a cosmic imagination, um, I'm careful with that because that seems like an analogy. And analogies are brilliant, but it is an analogy. So by analogy, I have an imagination, maybe the whole universe is being creatively imagined. I can get that as an analogy. I think there's some problems with all analogies and there's some problems with that one. But the actual, the conscious experience of a world of images does seem to me to have arisen with, you know, bio, you know, it's physics, biology, psyche, or soul. Um, the rel a realm of imagination has has arisen through that process, and that the it's arisen last. It's the latest thing we've got, which is why we're so intrigued by it, and it's changed everything for better and worse. Um, that 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 has come. I think probably we don't differ much on this. Because like you, I see uh, things developing, changing and evolving as being intrinsic to anything existing. So I, I, I absolutely go with that. It's just uh, the implication I thought that you were making that uh, at some point there was no such thing as creation, imagination in the universe. And then it came. Ah, OK, so you're associating imagination with creation, and I'm not seeing those two as the same. So I would see well, creation as, as... Well, as because imagination wonderful. involves consciousness. Yes, I just want to pick up your word analogy, because uh, it, once again, uh, it may be one of those words that's got a sort of built-in health warning, whereas, in fact, we can only understand anything by analogy. I agree. Um, yeah. Uh, it's not an option yeah. to think without analogy. And this is not just in the arts or in daily life, but it's true of mathematics and science. Yeah. So all the great discoveries are made by analogy. Yeah. So I don't think it, 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 it's uh, flawed because it's an analogy. I think it's a very important way of understanding the universe in which we exist. Completely agree with you. And, 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 and I use analogy personally to understand for myself all the time. Um, but I also think we need to be aware that that's what we're doing because of every course. analogy, including the mathematical analogies, of have limits. And we see that, I think, in physics, where you get this worldview arise from it, which shows the limits of the mathematical analogy. Well, one of my uh, strong um, intuitions is that there is something flawed about the analogies as are often used in modern science. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I'm writing about that in, in the book that I'm currently working on. Uh, one of the most important uh, things we need to do to free science is to stop it from modelling everything on a machine. It can be partly useful. Uh, there's actually nothing wrong with it as a, as a possible way of thinking about some elements of reality at a very local level. 
but that it begins to get less and less useful as one pans out from the detail. Yeah, I mean, it, that, that's part of what I've been, why I've been pulled in personally into an evolutionary approach to spirituality, mm -hmm. because it feels that uh, if you can get this, this sweep of evolution, there are things which apply to the first 10 billion years of physical evolution, which don't apply to biology and which is another realm altogether and which starts to create its own, it's emergent, new things arrive. I agree. And then with the arrival of soul, of psyche, of the mind, imagination, whatever name you give for that immaterial thing that we're connecting in right now, with the emergence of that, a whole new level of emergence happens in which it's really not appropriate to think about it in machine terms at all. Uh, whereas yeah. it might be for the fact that, you know, this will drop if I drop it. Yes. But not for I can lift it up or not choose to lift it up. That is not on the same level of that machine analogy. Well, there are um, eight or ten uh, important reasons why organisms are not like machines. Yeah. Uh, that's what I've been currently writing. Oh, is that right? <laughs> yes. oh, fascinating. But, but it doesn't mean that if you want to uh, isolate certain aspects of an organism for a very short temporal period and for a very short spatial re resolution, that you can see uh, things in terms of a mechanism. That's perfectly legitimate. But it, 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 it starts to run riot, and then one thinks of uh, the whole of an organism as like a machine, which it is absolutely not. Can I pull us back to somewhere we, were, we passed over, which I, um, I'd like to at least, at least have a few minutes on, mm. um, which is purpose, because uh, you mentioned purpose. Yes. And one of the key things for me, which makes me want to understand this, is not just what is it, but what should I do with it? Mm. I'm alive, I know that I'm going to die, mm. uh, life is full of joy and suffering. What, is there some, it, it, does it have a, a purpose? And a bit like you've been saying with words like story and analogy, when I came down, I was, my latest book was going to, my original thing was just to call it the meaning of life. And I realised it sounded like a joke mm. because everyone knows now that it doesn't have a meaning. And that's, that's a joke. Who would know anyway? And yet it feels like we live from, from those purposes. So the place that I've been, a lot of my, my, my method, I guess, is to look at the moment because that's what I've got and to see what's in it. And one of the things which came from that was, oh, each moment's the realization of a new potentiality. So every moment's new and every moment contains everything that's ever happened before. It's, it's implicit within it. Me arriving here is implicit of communication, the whole of the Big Bang, everything. Is that's actually, what you call pastivity. Yeah, it's every, the past is, 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 is present, as an idea which um, is a very powerful, I associate with Rupert Sheldrake and things like that, that this kind of, that it hasn't gone anywhere, and that this process has been one of the evolution realising potentiality. Um, so that the the purpose of existence is not so much it's not so much it has a purpose that the it's actually intrinsic to the very nature of what it is, which is that it's the continual realization of potentiality and because of the accumulation of everything that's happened in the past, there's a tendency towards more and more emergent realization, so that we can now have conversation because soul has emerged, psyche has emerged, which wasn't happening when there was just hydrogen. But that was a precursor for, for this. So that there seems then a very deep purpose with which we are intrinsic parts, which is to continue that realization of ever deeper, more emergent potentials. And actually, I think we're doing it right now in having this conversation because the new potentials now are being realized in the imagination. They're not particularly biological anymore or physical, they're happening on this imaginary or cultural soul level. And I just wondered how, how that resonates for you and your own thoughts, because I've heard you talk about being and becoming, and it seems similar in some respects. Well, I want to pick up two ideas that you, you've just raised. One is to do with meaning and the other is to do with purpose. Um, and they have something of the same structure to them. Uh, there's a certain way of thinking about what meaning is. Uh, for example, I can uh, tell you what the meaning of the instructions for how to operate uh, a new piece of machinery. I've got what, what, that, what it means. Like, it's very easy to do. But quite what King Lear means is another matter. Even more problematic is I can say, my wife means the world to me. 
Uh, and people say, well, what does she mean then? And uh, there isn't an answer that, that <laughs> could possibly work with that. No, nor does it work with great music. I mean, it right. seems to me that some of the most wonderful experiences pregnant with meaning can be derived from listening to Bach or, you know, but there's no conceivable way it can be reduced to a meaning in what I would consider the left hemisphere sense, mm. which is, come on, what's the, what's the meaning in, in sentences we can analyse and understand? But there is another kind of meaning which we experience with the whole of our being and is more implicit and can't be articulated because by articulating it, we, we reduce it. We, we, we cut bits off artificially from it and reduce its meaning by giving it an explicit meaning. Mm. Now, the same thing happens with purpose. When we say uh, something has a purpose, we normally mean... Uh, I can see uh, that doing this causes that, and that's an outcome that I wanted. That's a kind of uh, utilitarian purpose. It would seem to me that when we discover that we have no purpose, it's that kind of purpose we discover. There is no utilitarian purpose in that sense. It's not all designed by some engineer god to produce a certain result. What happens instead is that guaranteed by the fact that it is not reduced to an instrumental purpose in order to serve something outside of ourselves, because the engineer is serving his own purposes. Our lives are not engineered. This universe is not engineered in that sense. But it seems to me full of purpose. And that purpose is, I think, and this is where we agree, the fulfillment of potential. It's simply in what is there potentially becoming being. Mm -hmm. And once it's become being, the process moves on. So that's where you say everything that's happened is already still there, is that something is left behind by this process, but it's also changed by the continual becoming. So yeah. even though in, in retrospect it looked like this, now it's with further retrospect it looks different. Yeah. So the whole of everything is changing. And I would see the present moment as a something that is traveling through a medium of potential and actualizing as it goes, leaving this actual path behind it. And it's not determined from behind by a series of steps but actually drawn towards fulfillment of purpose. Beautiful. Wow, there's so much in there. Yes, the image for me was time is the, is the accumulation of what has been realised. So every potential that's been realised has been realised. Now, how, you, how we see it changes it, like you said, and it keeps morphing in that way, but it's also, in some way, it's fixed, the past. And, and then there's the potential. So the moment, right now, seems to be the meeting of the past and the possible always. And that the possible, I think, is what you mean by the creative or the cosmic imagination, as I called it, that, that kind of sense that there's something which is giving birth to something new, it's doing it now and now and now. And yet all of that, that each moment must, has two qualities, that it, it's the realisation of something that's never happened before, and everyone, and it must build, it must include within it the past. It, it, there's never a moment I've had which went, oh, this one didn't include the past. And there's never a moment which has gone, wow, this has happened before. And even if it were to happen before, it would be the second time, so it would be new. And it's, uh, it's that kind of, that, that journey of realisation potential, which seems to be fundamentally what a life is, as part of this gr greater journey, that I am doing that. There was a line that I came across from Keats. Um, I'm not going to get it right, you may know it and put me right for it, but it was something like, the world is a veil of soul-making. And I thought, I love that. This, it, because that's a, a very essential message for me. It feels like I'm making my soul, because I'm made of my past. I'm made of everything I've ever experienced, everything I've ever been. This is now part of who I am. And I'm making myself, or I'm being made as well. It's not just me doing it. No, I think that remark of Keats is, is both beautiful and, and quite deep. It's suggesting that the soul is not a being, an entity, a yeah. thing, yeah. but is instead an aspect of a process uh, which we help to nourish or can stifle. 
So in our lives, we can yeah. grow ourselves or we can stunt ourselves. Yeah. And it's those choices that make our life what it is. So I, I think that's a very, a very good remark. I, I don't altogether agree, but I think this is where we get into the a realm where language is extremely uh, difficult, but that the uh, present is where the past and potential meet. Because in me, and I know it's or, or coexist might be better. Well, yes. I mean, I think the thing is that it's very difficult not to, almost impossible not to spatialize when talking about time. Mm. So we see two two things that meet, mm. but of course they're not mm. uh, two things that meet. Uh, the present is an infinitesimal moment that travels through this business, actualizing as it goes. So the image that I have, which is another spatial metaphor and equally problematic for that, is more like something which is a cum like the Big Bang image, mm. where you've got the idea of space itself expanding, except it's not expanding in anything, which mm. is impossible to conceptualize. A bit like time is, is the same. It's expanding as it is accumulating. And just as we can look back through telescopes and see the distant past, we're seeing right back to, to where it's, it, where the, the, the accumulation of realization has happened within the possible, within this infinite, because it's because it, the possible has no qualities apart from potentiality. It's it's non-dual. It's it's emptiness, but it's full of everything because everything is arising within it. Well, I like that because the. The concept of emptiness, the Buddhist concept of emptiness, is often misunderstood. Yeah. Uh, we, we think of things in binary sort of ways. That it's uh, it, that means that there is there is nothing, uh, but there is no thing there. But this emptiness is the word um, sunyata is is derived from a root that means a seed that is potential to grow. And it, it's at the emptiness as of a womb that is a potential for something to grow in. Wow, and so quite often what we need to be doing this, I mean, this is a huge topic which we could talk about for many hours, <laughs> but the importance of the idea of negation, which in the Western tradition just looks like the absence of something important, but negation is the stopping doing things that get between us and something that is there for us to discover. Often what we need to do in order to be creative is not to make something happen, but to create a space in which what is already potentially there is invited to, to grow, to flourish and fulfill itself. Okay, well, I can't resist that being a cue to ask you a big question. So my... Uh strange life has led me to be interested in what traditionally gets called spiritual awakening or this transfer uh, waking up in consciousness to this presence which is completely spacious emptiness and one of the things which resonated you mentioned in passing in the conversation you talked about being something i think you said it's left brain or right brain and we haven't really touched on on that and I'm, I want to invite you to do two things, so there's a lot really, but to, to mention just the essence of what that dichotomy is about in, in, in your book, The Master and the Emissary. And the thing which I'm particularly interested in for me is how that, or does it, have anything to do with um, awakening or spiritual experience? Because one of the things I notice is that I meet a lot of people who come to me and go, look, I understand this all intellectually, but I don't experience it. And one of my jobs is to help them experience it. And that's probably what I do the most. And I wonder, is that to do with being trapped in a left brain conceptual understanding and needing to free up into a more uh, right brain understanding? Or is, or is that on another level altogether, do you think? Or is it, is it to do with that? And, and the other thing which referred back to something you said earlier, which is feels like the same thing of, for me, the, the gnosis that arises, the deep knowing, my, the most central thing is a gnosis, a knowing arises which is before words. And I try then my best to put it into words and what I end up saying is very naive and sounds a bit childish, like, it's all good really, despite everything. I know it's awful, but it's all so good, it really is. And it's, it's just very childish 
intuitions, but they, they're the deepest things I know. And I wondered, is that also to do with a, for you, with, to do with the left brain and right brain thing, or is that something separate, do you think? Everyday language arose in a, to enable us to, to utilize the world effectively. And we have to use special kind of language to deal with things that are not everyday realities for us. Because unless we're careful by expressing them in language, we reduce them to familiar things, whereas the whole point about them is we're trying to convey something that is unfamiliar. As Nietzsche said, words make the uncommon common. And what you're talking about are things that are, generally speaking, unusual, but nonetheless very deep in meaning. We wouldn't expect them to translate easily into everyday words. So I think that everyday language is a problem for certain kinds of understanding, because it, it tells us that we've got it. It says, I understand that, I've grasped it. Whereas, in fact, what it needs to do is to abdicate that power because it's actually a destructive process. It's getting between us and understanding something that only by removing language uh, we can contact. And uh, for me, one of the things, uh, I'm a psychiatrist, uh, has been an understanding that people who are particularly articulate often need special help with realizing things of um, a deep emotional kind. Uh, th this can be done by using implicit therapies rather than explicit therapies. A lot of therapy takes place in language, but there are therapies that don't involve that, that involve either um, metaphors of bodily movement, of enacting things, or of painting or sculpting. And often, you know, city lawyers would be very reluctant to go and do these therapies um, and I'd need to persuade them that it didn't matter that they had no artistic skill. But the trouble is they were so good at articulating things in everyday terms that that got between them and something which only when they were able to adopt a more implicit approach, a more oblique approach, um, came to life. Mm -hmm. Now, you asked me about the hemispheres, um, and it's a difficult thing to convey briefly, uh, Effectively, one needs to throw away all the preconceptions one has about what the difference between the hemispheres might be. Um, it took me 20 years of work to sort of to get some idea of what these differences were about and to try and counter the prejudice against the idea that there's some difference between the two hemispheres. Um, mind you, arguing that there isn't is a bit of a non-starter because all the things we can objectively measure, that science can measure, are asymmetrical in the brain. They're different sizes and weights and different shapes and have different convolutions and different cytoarchitecture, different neuroendocrine responses. They use different balances of neurotransmitters, different greater white matter ratio. There's everything about them that's different. And if you were a clinician rather than somebody merely working in a lab, you'd know from experience that when something happens to somebody uh, in terms of like a stroke or an injury to the brain, uh, it matters at least as much which side of the brain it's on as the site within that hemisphere. So uh, I wanted to find out what those differences were. And to summarize very simply, they seem to me to boil down to differences of attention mm. to the way we see the world. There is a, a, I don't perhaps need to unpack that, but there is a good Darwinian explanation of why we need to use two kinds of attention to the world. I can allude to it very briefly. We need to be able to get hold of things in order to eat them or to use them to, say, a twig to build a nest or pick up a seed rather rapidly before another bird does or latch onto a rabbit or whatever it is. Then for that, we need highly focused, extremely precise, but very localized attention, just a few degrees of the attentional arc. But if that's the only kind of attention we pay, we're vulnerable because we need also at the same time to be paying quite the opposite, a sustained, long-term, broad, open, uncommitted attention in which we haven't already made a preconception of what we're interested in. This brings us back to the question of what do we mean by conscious? Because I am only conscious in the focus of my attention of a tiny part of 1% of everything that 
my brain is receiving, that my body is receiving, because the brain is seamlessly connected to the nervous system, which is seamlessly embedded in the body with its muscles and its blood supply and so on. So everything we experience is information about the where we are, yeah. the environment. Um, and only a very tiny part of that is what we're aware of, but I can choose what I'm aware of. I can focus on that painting, or I can focus for a while on, on, on a piece of paper or whatever it is. I can choose what I focus on. But what I'm doing is excluding everything else for a while. What is very odd is that because we're so, we're so present with the thing that we're attending to by definition, that we forget that it's just a minute part of everything else. And we privilege it over all the other stuff. But actually, not, it's not necessary for us to be attending to things in order to make intelligent use of them. Our bodies are intelligently using information that I'm completely un unaware of. And even at a rather sophisticated level, my brain is taking in things that I can't articulate and I'm not aware of. Tiny changes in the musculature of your face that last for a tenth of a second. Uh, I'm aware of and understanding, for example. Um, so there's very much that gives meaning and importance to life that it doesn't even begin to become part of consciousness, never mind to become articulated in language. But earlier you mentioned how something very important came to you. You weren't sh sure where it came from, but you couldn't articulate it. There's some very nice um, research which shows at least implicitly, that our thinking begins at a pre-linguistic level with um, a sense of a gestalt, in other words, of a shape, a form, an analogy, a, a metaphor, a something, that it, our thinking is, is embodied in a, if you like, non-verbal way, visual way, or, or, or kinesthetic way, it, it, bringing all our senses to bear. And the next stage is that we allow the left hemisphere's language centers to process that in language. But that's only an intermediate step. In order to understand it fully, whatever has been made explicit then has to be reabsorbed. Uh, oh, that's the wrong way of putting it, but taken up again by the right hemisphere's global understanding and made so sense of in context. Okay. So, so how does that? I guess what I guess what I'm. Or I, let me come at this slightly different way. So, when I this I, I I came across a line in maybe in your book or something you said where you said look the whole universe is 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 polar dipolar. It's like, and it keeps on showing itself up. The brain is an example of that. One of the polarities which I work with as when I explore um, states of consciousness and awakening is that, that, it, that depending on where I put my attention, uh, I'm aware that we're individuals and separate, but there's a place where there's one universe and there's one of us meeting itself. And I have explored moving between those and seeing those existing alongside each other. And one of the ways that I explore that with people in, is a practice I've been doing for the last 20 years of just simply gazing. And what's fascinated me with gazing over the years is how different the connection is between the two eyes. Mm -hmm. So that I'm aware, there's so many levels to this, and I'm just wondering what, what your own thought, what, can, what light it casts on it. But So the first thing I'm aware of is the very basic level, is that when I connect with you, what I connect with is your, your, your face, your uniqueness, your body, and yet what I'm really connecting with I can't see. I'm connecting with another conscious being looking back at me. So something I, and, and so the thing that's connecting is it is not visible. And yet that's really what's happening here through the, through the looking. So that's the first um, polarity which I see. And then if I focus in on the eyes, I see that when, I, when you do it for long periods, that there's a quality to the two eyes which are quite different, nearly with everybody. Um, and one seems more individual, uh, in my experience, I feel much more like, oh, uh, for example, I, be, I connect with Ian, and then other seems much more spacious and universal, like I'm connecting with some depth of being which is also in me. 
And I wondered if there was anything to do with the, your studies of the brain which had any reference to that at all, or whether actually this is something which is transcendent of that completely. Well, when you say I, are you literally meaning how you see with your right eye and your left eye? So no, I mean, what I'm, what I'm it's really, it's what I don't know what I'm looking with really, but I'm aware that when I connect with your left eye or your right eye, for instance, that... So when I, you're looking at yes, my right or left yes, eye, exactly. you see something different. So what I do is I put people together and I, and I have them gaze at each other for a okay. long time. It transforms consciousness okay. almost immediately. Yeah. Um, partly to see that what they're connecting with they can't see. Yes. But yes. in the seeing... You can't help but go, oh, there's two eyes. Yes. Oh, there's one eye. Oh, yes. there's another eye. And then after a while, you start noticing, hmm, I feel really connected with Ian through that eye. Mm. But through that eye, I feel like I'm connecting with something huge and vast, mm. way beyond Ian. And I'm just wondering, is there any, anything in your research which casts light on that? Or does that feel like uh, something different altogether? Well, well, there's quite a lot in there. Um, <laughs> to deal with the last point first, which was about eyes, um, when you're looking at a face, the two halves of the face will be different. Faces are not symmetrical. Mm. Generally speaking, the left hemiface, the left half of your face, or my face, uh, is slightly larger than the right. Mm. Uh, it's also more expressive. Um, and it's one of the reasons why in all cultures, we think, uh, women cradle babies uh, to the left, because it brings them into the visual field of the right eye, which is more emotionally connected, if you like, with the infant. And it also exposes the infant's um, gaze to, to the mother's um, more expressive uh, hemi face. Wow. So uh, Fascinating. that is one possibility. Um, I suppose another is if you, if you take representations of faces and or photographs of people and cut them down the middle and and make uh, sort of uh, chimeric faces from yeah. joining them together, you find different, uh, quite astonishing differences. But you also find them particularly in the face of the way in which Christ is um, represented in art. This is not an accident. There is um, an iconographic tradition that the face of Christ should be asymmetrical in certain ways, which have interesting neurological um, foundations. Um, and one day I hope to write a bit about that. Uh, but actually, I've just been reading a book by William Empson called The Face of the Buddha, in which he uh, hones in on the asymmetries in the face of the Buddha, in which one half of the face seems to be uh, to do with the eternal and whatever, and the other is to do with helping you here and now. Okay. Uh, he says, That's and, exactly uh, the... his intuition, uh, but it's possibly a very interesting one. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm exploring it a that's, bit at the that's moment. That's exactly what I'm thinking. I think that's right. I think, I, I think also that the way in which we see things, I mean, once, once taught in medical school, and it's important to, to say this, and I always do, that you shouldn't assume that the left eye uh, is more connected to the right hemisphere than the right eye, yep. because uh, uh, it's the left visual field of each eye that feeds to the right hemisphere, and the right visual field of each eye that feeds to the left hemisphere. Okay, uh, whereas in many animals that have eyes on the sides of the head, there was pretty much a straight crossover. Ah. So you can tell they're using the left eye, they're engaging the right hemisphere. Which is why you can do these interesting experiments with birds and lizards and so forth, in which you can see that they tend to look out for predators with their um, left eye, which is the servant, if you like, of the right hemisphere. And they tend to latch on to prey using their right eye, which is the That doesn't sound very functional, giving the, the predators hemisphere. all around you. There are predators all around you, but uh, at any one moment in time, it's better to have two on the lookout, one doing one job and one doing the other. Yeah. Um, so, uh, to just to finish what I was saying, but I recently read some interesting research by Kenneth Heilman, who's a very distinguished um, scientist in, in the area of brain naturalization, suggesting that there may actually be differences between uh, what the left eye sees and what the right eye sees. But I, 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 I would just mention it in any case. So it might be actually that your left eye and your right eye might be contrary to scientific orthodoxy, has some 
intrinsic difference, but I, I wouldn't like to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it's more in what I've observed, really, and yeah. just trying to get, and it may just be a symbolic representation which naturally emerges, because it's not always one eye or the other, no, and that's no. interesting that you say they're connected. I mean, but what it brings to me, just to carry on with the other thing you mentioned, is the, is the, um, the business of how we're tyrannised by the eye. I mean, a phrase from Wordsworth actually talked about the tyranny of the eye, because it's the most prepotent of our senses. We identify our being here with what we see, yeah. At least sighted people do. Yeah. Um, there's interesting evidence from people who either were born blind or lost their sight that um, they perceive the world in a quite different way. There's a marvellous book called Touching the Rock um, by a man called John Hull who, who went blind in his middle years and made a very articulate account of how the world changed. But in any case, to go back to the fact that the, the visual sense is so domin dominant for us, I was going to say domineering, and it is a little, um, that we imagine that we're somehow here behind our eyes, which, which means that somehow we're localised in the head. Mm -hmm. But as um, Max Scheler, a um, 20th century German philosopher, pointed out, um, the thoughts and feelings that we have are in some sort of shared space. When I feel things with you, when we share ideas, there is, we're used to thinking that's in my head, that's in his head. But these things are going on somewhere which may or may not be more or less localised in either of our heads. Mm. Yes, absolutely. We assume it's, you know, clearly, clearly the brain plays an important part in it, there's no doubt about that. But the idea, the, the actual experiential referent I have is the imagination is nowhere somewhere else completely yes and that uh, we're sharing like i said we're existing in that realm yes. through the funny noises i i love that play of attention whereby i can see you and go oh here's a body making funny noises yes. and yet in the imagination it's full of meaning yeah and i'm and i'm yeah. bathing in your ideas yes. that have been passed to me but not here it's just, just literally just blah, 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 blah. So um, I, I want to just try and go to one um, big idea to um, uh, end our, our conversation. Um, I'm intrigued to know for you what, um, what you feel for you has been in your life and looking forward has given it purpose in, in, for you particularly. And, and how you've made sense of it as an individual with the inevitable hardships that we all go through and the, the, the heartbreaks and all of that side of life as well. What, 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 what has enabled you to maintain this lovely, infectious, curious, heart-opened presence to life? Well, of course, when you started that sentence, I was already beginning to search for what, what things were important have given meaning to my life. Yeah. And I was beginning to think it might be quicker to list the things that haven't. Okay. Um, I'm not going to do that. But, I, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm just thinking that um, despite the fact that my life has gone through many strange nights move steps from philosophy to literature to medicine to, you know, whatever, and it's gone through many phases. There have been very consistent themes. So like you, from a very early age, I was interested in questions that are foundational in, in, in philosophy and theology. And the life of the mind, uh, the pursuit of ideas simply because they are fascinating and alluring and tell me of themselves that there is something important here. That is one of the things that has guided my entire life and given it the sense of evolution and purpose that it has. But along the way, just about everything that I've encountered has enriched that in the sense of meaning. I mean, above all, of course, the love uh, I have experienced uh, in relations with, with family, friends, partners, um, things like music, poetry, mm. and the arts in general, and above all, perhaps the relationship with nature, which seems to me so profound and so elemental, 
that when I'm away from here, where I am surrounded, I only have to go out of the door to be surrounded by the natural world. When I go away, for example, I make increasingly um, infrequent visits to London, um, but I, I'm afraid it's, it's, it's like um, suffocating, and I really can't wait to get out of it, because it, it's the antithesis of just about everything that seems to me to matter, which is harmony, peace, uh, silence, um, not doing, um, attending, and slowly, deeply thinking about things. I can't find that in London. The press, the sheer press of of everything going on around me, most of which doesn't seem terrifically meaningful. It has, if you like, a beautiful illumination, illumination of my, my idea about purpose, that everyone seems to be driven by a purpose to get that bus, to go to that meeting, to do whatever it is. And yet the big question hanging over it all is, why? What's all this about? Whereas here, nothing seems to have a purpose. The plants grow, the trees grow, the sheep graze, the sea crashes on the shore, the rain comes down, the sun comes out. None of it seems to have any purpose, but it's full of meaning and purpose, if you see what I mean. That illuminates the difference. Yeah. So, provided I am not stifled by by being yammered at by, by media. I don't do social media at all. I don't have a television. I switch on the radio, not every day, but usually around six o'clock, just to reassure myself that the country still exists. <laughs> um, but it seems to me that it's much better for me to be spending time where I love to spend it, which is in dealing with things that are not time limited, that, that are, in a way, the, the really interesting questions about what we're doing here in this, on this planet, in this universe at all. That's what gives the richness to life and for me both meaning, extraordinary meaning and an extraordinary sense of purpose. And I'm not bothered in the least by the fact that it's coming to the end. For various reasons I don't need to go into, it's probably coming rather quickly to me. But I, I don't mind that at all. I am intrigued to know what happens when my body is no longer here. And if nothing, I won't be disappointed. <laughs> You've just at the end of veered us into death, which is a major preoccupation of mine, as I don't feel we can possibly understand life without at least questioning death. I agree. I agree. And it's, you know, it's been a meditation, uh, Plato's a soft whole of philosophies of meditation on death, and I kind of feel that. So, um, as have you and how how you mentioned you know okay it's it's okay and that you if you if if nothing happens you won't know but where do you have a, a theology of it as it were or do you have a a intuition with the nature of death and its relationship with life? Well, I'm uncertain of most things, but probably nothing quite as uncertain as as about that particular question. I really don't know. Um. I say I'm intrigued, but then I have personal experience of going to extremely dark corners of the universe in my consciousness yep. um, at times. So I know that, as it were, there are very painful places in the cosmic consciousness. Yep. And it's not guaranteed that, um, on an end of one anyway, that, that everything is going to be... Uh, tolerable yeah if consciousness persists but i have a view that my consciousness and i think we might disagree about this but i think my consciousness as me um will not persist in any obvious way i think that i'm like and we are like eddies in a stream that for a while are visible measurable photographable, they have force, but they they move on, or a wave in the sea, which for a while can be very powerful, can break things and can is, is, is palpable, but it's absolutely seamless with the water of the sea at large, much as the whirlpool is seamlessly part of the river that flows. And I, I see water actually as a very good image, one I'm always coming back to, um, 
in trying to understand existence, um, and in fact use images of various kinds of streams. Yeah. And my um, all-time favourite philosopher Heraclitus yeah. famously, supposedly said, yeah. all things flow. But uh, I think that we're therefore, it's not that our having been is of no avail, but it, it's that it is no longer, um, it's no longer palpably there. It, it, it reminds me slightly of my whole idea of the way in which we understand anything or get to learn anything, which is that we have an attraction to something based on our right hemisphere sort of sense of a connection, say a piece of music. Then we go to a period when it's all made explicit. The left hemisphere realizes it has to practice that passage at bar 28 and oh, there's a return to the dominant at bar 52, whatever it is. And then when you go on stage, the performance happens and you must not be thinking of all yeah, those things. Absolutely. But it's not that therefore they're negated yeah. or it was pointless. There is this idea, a Hegelian idea, of something being taken up into something greater. Okay, so that's really resonant for me. And, and, and the image that he gives, which is not a bad one, is that there cannot be fruit without there having been a flower and there cannot be flower without there having been a bud. So each of these is important. Each of these carries the flow and has its purpose for a while. But they're all subsumed in the process of this plant producing this fruit. OK, so let me... Let me so that my own meditations on it, which are always completely provisional and based on my own experiences of being around death quite a bit and, and after-death connections as well, and just trying to make sense of them, um, but also the philosophical movement. Um, we were talking earlier before we were filming um, about, and I said that I see this movement from unconscious oneness and then the, 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 the process of becoming, of individuating, leads to greater and greater consciousness as things become more complex and more individuated until they've got you and I, which compared to most things around here, uh, the trees and the windows and the floor, it's pretty individuated. We're able to have this whole conversation about the nature of life. Um, and then you've got death. And one of the things which uh, I was very influenced by a lot of Eastern philosophy, mysticism generally, and there's a very traditionally pessimistic view, I think, underlying spirituality, which is to, it's, it's not so much an evolution, it's a fall. We've been in some place which was better and we've fallen and we need to get back. And one of the ways that works out in, in a lot of the Eastern traditions and non-dual traditions is... Um, you, you, the, the best thing would be if you could dissolve your individuality back into the oneness, because your individuality is just in the way. It's, you know, Tim, what the problem is Tim or Tim's ego or something, you know, which is in the way and get rid of that. And at death, if you're really smart, you're, there will be the light, which is the great light of possibility, the clear light of potentiality, as the, the Tibetan Book of the Dead calls it beautifully, I think, the, that you can dissolve back into and everything's returned to the way it was. Which sounds great if you don't think about it too much, and act, but actually negates the whole process. It's like, so I'm going through this, this creative agony of being, of individuating for nothing. I agree. And that I find very, uh, un doesn't satisfy me at all. And so the place that I've been playing with is the opposite of that, which is not to dissolve into the light, but actually to not dissolve that actually it's only by holding our individuality that we are conscious. And that the process, the whole process of the, the, the evolution of the universe for these 13, 14 billion years has been to individuate. And that it's on the soul level, on, this, on the level which we experience already as immaterial, it is not sub, it's life and death are not an issue. It's because it's not biological anymore. It's information or, or existence on a different level. And the, the whole point is to get that to be more and more robust and able to sustain itself in a disembodied state where it can actually commune with the ground of being, which we can do now, but which seem, seems to be what people describe in near-death experiences and, um, and in the spiritual literature, not to dissolve into it, but to actually create it. And that in some way, and this is kind of resonant maybe with people like um, Thierry de Chardin, people like that, that, that it's not coming from God, it's going to God. And that the universe is giving birth to the most emergent thing possible, which is God. And that when we commune in the light, we are creating, or just in the oneness, 
not by dissolving ourselves, but becoming so individuated, so conscious, so, so particular, and so not just embedded in our unconscious conditioning, but actually becoming ourselves, that we, can, we are sparks then, and that the, the light is all of those sparks communing. So the analogy for me is just as my, my body is a communion of cells, that, that there is a transcendent being which is a communion of souls, and that when we enter that more awake space where you are conscious that behind Tim there's this oneness of being, we are bringing God into existence. Well, I, I, I wouldn't disagree with much of that. I certainly believe that, that, that God is a process of becoming, that God is becoming. Right. And that we have a crucial role in that. We're not just some sort of weird epiphenomenon. Right. But that the whole purpose of individuation in creation was that there should be something other than God that could love God and God could love. So we co-evolve um, God and ourselves. Uh, we are part of God's evolution. And so we play a very valuable role. I certainly would also agree that we don't just, I don't like never have done and have written against the, the common uh, Eastern spiritual idea that somehow there's a problem with my, my I, mm. my being, myself. Uh, like you, I think, what's the whole pother about <laughs> if the idea is just negated? And it seems to me that it's part of the unfolding and unfurling of something, which is a whole, which, when it's just potential, is almost a nothing, an emptiness, but that comes into being through the constant unfolding of individuation yeah. within something that is never breached. So that it's not, in, not an atomizing, it's not, a, it's not a, a fragmenting, it's an enriching by implicit, the implicit becoming more explicit, of a a whole that is constantly growing and developing. That's the way I would see the universe and God as either the ground of that, not, not the starter of it, like he pushed a button and then went off and watched the nine o'clock news, but, 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 but that God <laughs> he is... He wasn't paying attention the whole time. <laughs> that, that God, that God is, uh, is the ground of it in the sense, uh, ontologically, outside of time, is sustaining whatever this is. So I, I think we would probably agree, I, I suspect, about most, most of that. It's perhaps the degree and the nature of the minus that exists afterwards. I think that while we're here, maybe we are more encapsulated and cut off from things than we will be afterwards. Yep. One way I think of this is of a membrane it could be the membrane of a cell, but it could also be um, a membrane in physics that um, has uh, undulations. And if you like, when you're in one of these outpouchings or undulations inside it, um, you're almost enclosed, and a lot of what you feel reflects back from the sides of this. But it is, in fact, open deeply to everything else, and that you are therefore part of this whole that for a while is doing... Tim Freak or Ian McGilchrist. Yep. And afterwards, the Tim Freakness and the Ian McGilchrist are not lost, but they're more connected to what is everywhere else. Did you say they're not lost, they're more connected? Yes. yes. And, and uh, William James, who I think is you know, one of the most reliably wise writers in the last 500 oh, years, I agree completely. Um, says uh, somewhere that he sees us, I mean, it's perhaps not a particularly original idea, but it's a good one. He sees us as like um, islands above the water who are all fundamentally connected yeah. when you go down below the water level. Yeah. And uh, that has its problems too as an analogy, yeah. but perhaps only by thinking in terms of analogy can we, can we come to any kind of understanding. So I would agree with all that. I also would um, suggest that it comes out of a nothing um, and that, again, negation is terribly important. Heidegger has been much mocked for a thing he said, das nichts selbst nichtet, the nothing, nothings itself. And a number of not particularly imaginative analytic philosophers have gone, oh, what nonsense, you know, piffle. And, I mean, of course, according to... The absence of absence is presence. Well, that. there's something in that. 
Mm. That the nothing is not, we have no language for this, but not an utterly empty nothing. It is mm. a nothing that, outside of which there is nothing. So it is the original state, but nothing will always nuff itself. And in doing so, something comes into being. And that is the something so, that is growing. Uh, what I get from that is if you have nothing and it negates itself, you get something. Yes. So that, that kind of turning back. So, so, so the, the theology, and I guess really I, I call myself a philosopher, but actually when I look at what I'm, I'm interested in, it's kind of really a theology. I just feel uncomfortable with the word. But is, this, is, is, is kind of... Oh, God as Alpha and Omega, like where it starts and where it ends, although I don't think it starts or ends, but just as a, as a way of framing the idea. So that you've got the ground of being, which has no qualities but being, is, which is therefore the potential of everything that becomes. So it's not conscious for me, because it's not anything. It's, it's just not. It's, it's un. But it's being, which is going to give birth to, and is, I suspect, continually giving birth to, never started, but is, for our universe started, uh, giving birth to this becoming, which is reaching, because of, it, reaching ever into ever more emergent possibilities. And therefore, the, and the most emergent possibility is this conscious of itself, this oneness of being conscious of itself. But it only gonna, that oneness will only become conscious of itself through individuating. And that's the paradox. And we are that, we are in that process. And that through us, we can, we're con if we throw our consciousness back onto our being, there's a universality to it, because there's a presence for witnessing the imagination and the sensation, the body and the mind, um, body and soul. And that, but the presence itself has no qualities but being. And that's the great insight of mysticism, mm. that you can be aware that your deepest being is the being of everything, even though it's become conscious through Tim or Ian, and that's absolutely unique and wonderfully so, and, and precious for that. Yes, I, I think that is that is right, and and also in the uh, European mystical tradition, Meister Eckhart in yeah. particular, perhaps Jakob Burma, yeah. um, are particularly good on on this. Uh, they avoid to an extent, while embracing the idea that God is many paradoxical things. They they. In fact, by embracing that it is paradoxical, they avoid the simple idea that the negation of the I or the ego, or the, no, the ego is another matter, but of, the, of, of my minus yeah. would be a good thing. I thought you made a brilliant point when you mentioned that um, it's one I need to clarify because I, I may have given an impression I didn't want to, but you said, so this God has no qualities in it, in, in, initially, as it were. And um, because it's, it's nothing. And so it can't be conscious. And I agree with that. When I say that I think consciousness is foundational, I think one has to separate the idea of something utterly, utterly unknowable and unspeakable about, which in all religions God is, that we cannot describe, that is the origin of everything. And the next step in which there is something. Now, as soon as there is something, I believe there is both matter and consciousness. Ah, okay. And so I, th I, I would call that just subjectivity. That, that, well, that, no, it's I, just a matter of words. Well, I right? wouldn't because, okay. because I think the whole subject object divide is. I mean, sometimes people think so is the right hemisphere subjective and the left hemisphere objective? And the answer is no. The left hemisphere thinks there's such a thing as being subjective and objective. The right hemisphere sees that. It's a betweenness, which is neither subjective nor objective. Yes. And so what occurs when there is something is there is a betweenness, and that is this, it's love, or whatever you like to call it, this force between the primal whatever that can't be said and the thing that is coming into being. Ah, the relationship between the them. relationship between them. The, then consciousness is already in there because consciousness is a betweenness. If it's not that, it's nothing. As soon as there is something in which there can be betweenness, then there is consciousness. Betweenness of the of the potentiality with the, of being and becoming. Yes. That relationship. That, well, that relationship and the one between what in in the Kabbalah is called. Ends off the okay. primary being. This is not yeah. quite equatable with God. Yeah. It is a sort of 
the thing that cannot be... It's kind of closer to what I mean. Closer to what you're talking about. And and, and God, the vision of God in the more personalised sense, that being of love, when God is love... Is what is now coming into being. That's what comes to be, which is why you don't see much obvious of God as love through the first, whatever, billion years of evolution, because God isn't love at that point. Exactly. God is becoming love. God is, and is also, because of this becoming, is not actually either omniscient or omnipotent. Exactly. And I, I think this is very important. Me too. And recently I've been saying it to some fairly orthodox theologians and being surprised that they're willing to accept that. Oh, that's very good to hear. Um, because I come to exactly the same thing. How can I rescue this experience I have of a transcendent being of love and goodness with the reality that, of the world and of evolution? And I think putting, if you put that figure at the front, you've got endless problems and no matter how many theological sleight of hand you, you employ will not go away. Y- yes, that's right. But I want to... Um, embellish what I've just said okay. um, in the light of the hemispheres, because I think okay. it makes sense to me anyway. Okay. Um, when I say that a God is not omniscient and not omnipotent, I don't mean either that he's not omnipotent, omniscient or omnipotent, because I just think the terms are wrong. Okay. So he's he's not a potentially omnipotent being that is somehow falling short of omnipotence, nor a potentially omniscient being that is somehow falling short of omniscience, which is what it sounds like if I say God is not omnipotent and omniscient. But what I'm saying is that the left hemisphere conceives knowledge in a very special way, which is that it is a kind of factual, almost objective, propositional knowledge. I know that H2O is water. I know that Paris is the capital of France or whatever. That is a kind of knowledge. So that might be God knows that the day after tomorrow I'm going to be run over by a car, but is helpfully not telling me. That, that, is, that is the kind of omniscience that is irrelevant to God. Because <laughs> God very depressing. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but God, God, God's knowledge is of a kind that we don't have a word for in English, frustratingly, but every other language that I've come across does. It's the difference between, in French, savoir, which is the kind of knowledge I've been talking about, yeah. and connaître, which is to know somebody, to know a place, to know... Grok is the word that comes to mind from... Uh, OK. Uh, do you know the, um, the science fiction... I'm, the, the, uh, it's a famous book called One of the many the things I'm, I'm lacking is science in, fiction knowledge. In which knowledge, but... a word precisely for this. Uh, OK. Of knowing some, like knowing, knowing that that is a glass and knowing yes. the cup yes. to grok something. And so what, what this kind, kind of knowledge is, is an encounter. OK. It, yes. The other yes. kind of knowledge is a proposition. Yes. This is an encounter. Yeah. And it's the same in German, where they distinguish between Wissen, sort of as it were, factual knowledge, yeah. and Kennen, to get to know. It's yeah. always a process. You, I can never know you. I can only get to know you more and more. We say that, don't we? To we get, you. And, and I to can, get it. Yeah, yes, and I can get to know this place. Yeah. I can get to know a piece of music. Yeah. So th- that's different from knowing yeah. that in the past that this yeah. is the case, as it were. It, it's finished and that's that. Okay. So God's okay. knowledge is canon. Okay. And God can only... Therefore, his knowledge is, is perfect in the sense that fulfilling what is happening, he knows everything that is happening. So in that sense, he's omni... Not omniscient, but an omni-knower. We don't have a word for it. Of, a diff- of the other kind of knowledge. Well, that's a and beautiful and idea, the, the same thing applies to omnipotence, because the left hemisphere sees power as the ability to manipulate. Effectively, the left hemisphere controls for us the right hand with which we manipulate things. It's the one that creates tools and uses them. It's the one that uses the bits of language that help us pin things down. But so its agenda is about interfering in the world in order to produce a certain outcome. But God's potency is not the potency of an interfering God or an engineering God, which would be that kind of omnipotence. So it's not that he could potentially be omnipotent, but somehow is falling short because there are certain things he can't do. He's just using that term at all about God is a mistake. It's a category error. Instead, his power is to bring into being everything that is. So it is 
the, the foundational power, that is his omnipotence, to bring everything that is into being. And he doesn't, he doesn't sort of set aside what it can be, because if he did, it would just be a, a dead extension of him. It's got to be something other, and therefore it's got to take its own course. But I don't think that that means that necessarily it's all bad news, because, <laughs> because like you, I think there's, although there are many ups and downs on the path, as there are bound to be in any natural system that is finding its way, it's going to fluctuate around certain means constantly. There is an upwards movement of evolution in everything in the universe, which I, that's, that bit I will agree with. I, I, it doesn't apply to whether we're better in 2018 from what we were in 1518, but it does apply to things that are more interesting, better and richer now than they were when there were only um, sea slugs. Yeah. And uh, interestingly, when people want to express how awful creation is and how vicious this god, if he existed, would have to be, they resort to often really quite primitive uh, elements in the history of life, you know, an ich Newman fly or something. Now, I know that we can, we have the particular power to be specially cruel, but that's the flip side of our being able to be particularly good and produce all kinds of things that you and I know about that an ich Newman fly cannot. And on the whole, it seems to me, that with the evolution of mammals, of course, they eat one another, but they don't do the, the, the really particularly um, horrific things that, that people finger when they go, a god that creates this just to happen like that. However, it's got to be left untrammeled. And if that happens, human beings will be led by a path towards something. I think that's the point. There is a, a goal, which is something embedded in in something sacred and, and, and benign, ultimately. But that on the way there, we, you can't separate the, the, the good from the bad. That was one of the things I felt in your book, I may have got it wrong, but I felt that um, there, was a, there was a sort of non-acknowledgement of the role of opposition in the evolution of everything, that actually the contraries are just as important as the consonances. The co the, the, what happens in evolution is cooperation, which is both competition and collaboration. I, I, actually, I, I don't think I do go into that, actually, although it's a major theme of my previous book, okay. um, The Mystery Experience. But actually, yes, I, com I, completely, see, I completely think that. So, so this is a, you know, I don't know, a dangerous analogy, maybe a crude one, um, but I'll just play it out with you just to see what you think. Because one of, the, one of the ways that I can imagine that and just try and see it is I think, oh, well, look, I have come into existence from a very simple beginning. My body has come into existence from a simple beginning, and it's enabled, one way or another, this experience of being conscious not only of sensation but also of soul of imagination, and, and I can disappear off, and this, the, the whole wonders of my life has come from these, you know, Sperm and an egg, and you know, wow, that's incredible, that, that complexity. And then here's this emergent being of soul, and I have some control over it. But it's only some. I agree. And if the universe is doing something comparable, it is giving birth to something which is transcendent, which has some control over it, but it has to accommodate itself to all of these more primitive levels, just like I have to accommodate myself to all these primitive levels. And so that this thing, this presence of, of communion, which I experience as love, as, as the, the felt communion, uh, is the transcendent thing which is emerging, which is calling me to it, um, but which, ha which it has to accommodate and I have to accommodate, or the more prim primitive levels which has allowed it to, to exist. Well, I, I like that very much and I, I largely agree with it. Um... I think that uh, the only point I would stress is that um, Heraclitus again hit the nail on the head when he said war is the father of all things, which of course yeah. he didn't advocate a military <laughs> uprising strife, or yeah. strife, yeah. no. What he was getting at is it is only out of the coming together of opposites that new yeah. life comes yeah. and that therefore it's intrinsic to this process that there will be both the things that we in our naive way, want to foster in the things that we don't. Yeah. And we're, we're, it's okay for us to steer things, but the mistake is when we think that things are ever unipolar, yeah. 
So yeah. we decide X is good, and the more of it we have, the better things we'll get. But there is nothing, actually, that the more of it you have, however good it is, things will get better. Because you need to have a bit of the opposite as well. Exactly. And, and, it, and, that, and it flips, doesn't it? Yeah. Constantly. Oh, it does. And, and the, 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 it's a very Taoist insight, I think. Well, it, it's inescapable. And it's a bit like having a, a magnet that has a north and south pole. And you go, I think I only like the south pole. I don't like the north pole. So I'm going to cut it off. Yes. Now you've just got a shorter magnet with a north pole. Well, and the one I love is, you know, I just want left without right. But every time I go left, this damn right thing keeps following me. And, 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 and that yeah, feels all, like with all, all of, of that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I, I think you, you and I agree on that. But I think it's a very, very basic point that um, people may go, yes, yes. But do they actually take that into account when they think about um, philosophical issues? Um, because I think it does help illuminate a number of the conundrums that well, you've been... You, you obviously work as a psychiatrist, but I, and I, I deal with the psyche insofar as people who are exploring awakening. And the place I've ended up, which is incredibly simple often with people, is just to go, look, look don't try and get rid of the thing which is bothering you. Just mm. find the opposite. Mm. Don't try and deny... Yeah, a, a very this. good. Just yes. look, look for the opposite, because it will yes. be there too. Yes. Even in the worst of times, yes. find the one thing which is not. Or... No. I think that's very good. It also encompasses the idea of acceptance of um, fallibility, weakness, the dark side, the things that um, we don't like. And that doesn't mean to say we become complacent about them. We strive to, to further its opposite as much as we can. But we acknowledge that it's there. And a lot of my work as a psychiatrist actually could be seen uh, not with psychotic patients, which is a separate, I mean, in a way they've got a brain illness that yeah. you're not going to have a conversation with them on this sort of a level, yeah. um, not at least until they've got out of the psychotic episode. But, but for a lot of my patients, um, what I was doing was helping them to accept um, their dark side mm. and to stop being obsessed by the idea that things should be all of a certain kind that their lives should have only these things in them rather than all the downsides of those things. Yeah. Or that their personality should be single and perfect and so on. It just isn't the case. It's only a lack of insight that makes one think that it could be possible to be a, anything other than a very flawed human being. Yeah, really. And, and there's something <laughs> lovely about it. Isn't that marvellous? Isn't it? And just because well, I work with awakening, the, the thing that you said earlier of of you know that you'd always felt also that, that, that this denial of the individual is is, mm. is disastrous. I mean, I feel it as a parent. I, that's how it really came to me. I just looked at my young children and mm. thought, all these things which I've picked up in spirituality are wrong. I'm not sitting to my young daughter going, you know, darling, uh, don't develop an individuality <laughs> or the mind. Oh, the monkey mind. Stop thinking. I'm really worried about school. It keeps making you think. It's a terrible thing. If only you stop thinking, you'd be enlightened. Or all these, yeah, or don't be yeah. attached. Yeah. Well, oh, of no, course, or, these things have meaning, as you and I know. Of course. But uh, they, they have meaning. My point is... Within they, a context they, and up to a point. And they have, well, I, my feeling is they have, they, have, they have real meaning to me if I see it's both and, not either or. Yes. So there's a place which there's is place silent. For, where there's no thought. Yeah. And if you don't know that and you're just in thought... And that needs to be cultivated noisy. because the pressure of our culture is to the opposite. Yes. So what it is, it's more addressing I, a balance. Exactly. It's not about saying not this is bad, and this, this is good. Not both. No. And somehow it's much easier, I think, often for me, I think for the people I deal with, for instance, with awakening to that, to that powerful sense of communion of oneness, yes. which 40 years ago when I started doing it myself, felt like, God, how do you ever do this? Yes. And, and it... The, 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 that I could be now, this ripe old age, travelling around to people in different cultures and being pretty confident that people will experience this. Yes. And the key, I would say, that is the key shift, was that I now go, you're great as an individual. Mm. I love Ian. How yeah. marvellous. Mm. Mm. And through Ian, oh, there's God. Mm. And mm. That the, the, this oneness is there as well, not instead. Ah. Suddenly people could relax into well, being this ambivalent person they know they are and there's this transcendent thing just waiting just behind and it's so obvious and then there's both. Well that that's, uh, leads me to, to something that I think is terribly important and it's very hard to articulate but that we find the infinite through the finite exactly. and we find the general through the particular yes. and somebody who just loves mankind is not loving anybody. Yeah. You love mankind through loving 
individual people. Yeah. Um, Blake sing about he who does good must do so in minute particulars. Oof. And uh, what a line! Yes, um, he goes on to say, "General good is a plea of the something in the scoundrel." But uh, but no, I think that is terribly, <laughs> terribly important, and it therefore involves acceptance. And so much, I mean. This is a drum I bang a bit these days, but so much depends on acceptance. It's really what I was saying about patients, that often what they needed was to accept things that were causing them grief because they didn't accept them. Mm. And, you know, one of my mantras was, I'm not all right, you're not all right, but that's all right. <laughs> and, you know, we're constantly being pressured to make everything like some sort of unreal ideal, and it's just not necessary. But if one actually accepts things, it's so much easier to forgive, it's so much easier to experience gratitude. And these are the things that keep you happy and relishing the business of living. And know? there's something so ironically anti-life about the other view to me. Because yeah. every step, every time I love, I've loved, you know, you, you've said ideas today, which I will go away and think about deeply, so, and, and will create a new understanding, I hope. And so, but the part of that will be seeing something I hadn't seen before, and may involve seeing things which I saw differently and have to go, oh, I was wrong about that. So, and, and in, in my growth as a human being, as a, as a soul, it's constantly, oh my God, you know, every time I mess up, I have to, there's a, there's a certain humility that is enforced by that, which is, so, I'm, so the process of growing, of evolving, of becoming more, that I, more of what I could be, is constantly getting things wrong and seeing my inadequacy Absolutely. in an accepting way and learning and moving. So the idea of, of trying to make it all perfect would be to, to actually just, to just jam up the whole journey. And, it, indeed. And wouldn't that be a shame? Well, you say, wouldn't it? It's already happening. But yeah. <laughs> there we are. Yeah. Well... Ian, thank you so much for um, allowing us to come to this amazing place on the Isle of Skye and to have a conversation which I was looking forward to and which has been even more wonderful than I expected. So. Well, it's been a great pleasure and I just wish we had longer. But uh... Thank you. I loved meeting Ian as I knew I would. I loved the way he picked up on the meaning and etymology of words so we could see more clearly what we were talking about. I loved how every idea resonated with his deep knowledge of human culture, bringing out some wonderful quote or insight. I felt moved by his comments about going to the dark corners of the universe and his vision of death. I really relate to the idea that there is a meaning we understand with the mind and a meaning we understand with the whole of our being. But most of all, I enjoyed connecting soul to soul and meeting in the great mystery of it all. <laughs> <laughs>